When you talk about an expanding universe, exact distances get really, really strange. So it's hard to put a proper number on that. It's at uh, around redshift 9.3, which in terms of time puts it only a couple hundred million years after the Big Bang. So very, very early universe. That was Dr. Anthony Taylor at the Cosmic Frontier Center of the University of Texas at Austin. And he's talking about the most distant black hole yet confirmed. We're seeing it as it existed just 500 million years after the Big Bang. So about 13.3 billion years ago, when our universe was just 3% of its current age. I spoke to Dr. Taylor yesterday and wow, I learned some things. For example, how do supermassive black holes come to be in the centers of galaxies, even like our own Milky Way? Here's Dr. Taylor describing how he and his team use the James Webb Space Telescope to discover the most distant black hole yet. So this, uh, all, this is all really thanks to the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, over the last couple of years, there's been a bunch of very large surveys that have taken nice chunks of the sky and taken very deep images, and which has allowed us to find thousands upon thousands of uh, stars and galaxies. We've then gone into these images and looked for good candidates that could be these types of objects. So we're looking for black holes in the very early universe. We're trying to find thing, objects that are generally rather point-like, and based on the colors that we see on them, they, uh, that can hint at them being very, very far away. So, other, so programs such as CAPERS have, done, have gone back with the James Webb Space Telescope and looked at some of these candidates that we found in the imaging, and instead looked at them with spectroscopy, where we take the uh, light from these objects and we split it out into all of its different wavelengths. And this object here, which we wound up calling CAPERS LRDZ9, was one of our promising candidates. We got the data uh, a couple months ago and uh, we were surprised, delighted, and overjoyed to uh, find this object. And so, so tell me the name of the object again. Say it slowly. We call it CAPERS LRD Z9. So CAPERS is the name of the JWST program that confirmed it. We call it LRD, meaning little red dot, which is a new class of objects that's been discovered by JWST. And we call it Z9 because it's at redshift nine. Z is usually our uh, uh, letter used for redshift. Tell us about, give us the context here. Like what's going on? You're looking really far away yep. uh, in the universe. And so you're looking at the very early, early universe close to the Big Bang that's thought to have created our universe. So, so what's going on in space at that time? What's, what's happening? And, and why is this black hole there? Why can we see it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in these very early epochs, this is when some of the first stars have already started to form, the first galaxies are forming, and also the first black holes are starting to form. And that's one of the things that makes this object very, very special, in that the black hole in this object is extremely massive compared to what we might expect from those early eras. Generally speaking, in the universe, when you start with, uh, you know, be it stars, galaxies, you start with small things that eventually build up to become much, much larger. In terms of black holes, we talk about what we call seeding mechanisms. So for a while, the commonly accepted seeding mechanism for black holes was you have a star of a you know, fairly massive star that goes supernova and it leaves a black hole behind. And then over time, it, uh, you know, it, it creates gas and dust around it and grows and grows and grows. And when we look at black holes in the local universe, in the nearby universe, well, those have had 13.8 you know, billion years to grow from something very small to the supermassive things that we see today. Okay, but the, and so, oh, are you, are you done? No, I've got a little more on this. So what's interesting about Kaper's LRDZ9 though, is that it's extremely massive, but it's only, but we're seeing at a time when the universe was only about 500 million years old. So it, it pushes forward a lot of questions as to how can we get something so big so quickly? And so this, so, so you're saying that it started with a massive star and the star went supernova and the core of the star collapsed, created yep. a black hole. And is, is this the mechanism for creating the first black holes in the centers of galaxies that grow to become the supermassive black holes 
that we now see in nearly all galaxies? So for a long time, that was the accepted mechanism. But now we've, uh, especially in the last decade or so, we've started having uh, other evidence that that might be challenged. Even before JWST, we were finding black holes in the early-ish universe that were pretty massive and started putting a little bit of stress on that idea. And so instead, there's been ideas of how what uh, we call heavy seed black holes. So this could be where you have a large, very, very large mass of gas that instead of fragmenting into individual stars and having them go supernova and turn into small black holes, if you can allow this gas to cool very, very slowly, you can have the whole gas cloud collapse in on itself and form a black hole directly. That's what we might call a direct collapse black hole. You can also potentially do this with a number of star clusters. We have a bunch of star clusters that all group together and collapse together into a black hole. These black holes start out much more massive, so they get a head start over their lower mass counterparts. And the biggest thing, uh, the other factor, is that when you're more massive as a black hole, it means you can consume matter more quickly. So the rich get even richer in this case. If you start out with a bigger black hole, you can grow it much more quickly. And when we see objects like Kapers LRD Z9 in the very early universe, we see strong evidence that we either need a heavy seed to start with, or we need a light stellar mass seed that is consuming matter and growing much more quickly than uh, what we're normally used to seeing. And so is the, is the mass, uh, well, first of all, how massive is it? So this is uh, about um, uh, 40 million solar masses. 40 million solar masses. So okay. roughly 10 times the mass of Sagittarius A star, the uh, black hole at the center of our galaxy. Right. And it's, it's very different from the black hole at the center of our galaxy because it's still consuming material, correct? Absolutely. This is a this is what we call an active black hole or an active galactic nucleus. Yes, this black hole is absolutely currently eating up tons of matter. And when it does that, it compresses that matter before it uh, you know, really gobbles it up. And that compressing of the matter causes that matter to get superheated and glow brilliantly bright. So while most people think of black holes as being dark, how would we ever see one? It's not that we're seeing the black hole itself, we're seeing the gas and dust that's spiraling into it. And its last moments, or well, last millions of years before it falls into the black hole, it's superheated, glows brilliantly hot, and that's the signature that we can see all the way here from Earth, or in the case of James Webb Space Telescope, from a solar orbit. <laughs> right, right. And so why is it in, why are these black holes in the centers of galaxies? So, so generally speaking, we think that black holes are likely to be in the center because they serve as a nice anchor point for uh, getting the galaxy to almost orbit around it. They're, nice, they're much more massive as, well, yeah, as sort of a point particle, so to speak. They're much more massive than any other individual structure in the galaxy. So it's convenient for them to fall down almost into the center of the gravity well and then sort of anchor that gravity well. So they don't necessarily start out in the center, but they, at some point, because they are so massive, they sort of fall into the center. That's the generally accepted theory. Yep, a black hole could form in any part of a galaxy, especially a young galaxy where not all of it's formed yet. But generally speaking, gravity likes to keep things spherical. It likes to keep things uh, symmetric just naturally tends towards it. And so the massive black hole will tend to eventually, even if it is wandering a bit to start, in the local universe, we generally see these uh, well localized at the centers of galaxies. And so this object turned out to be uh, part of another recent discovery uh, of what are known as little red dots. What are little red dots? So at the most basic level, the name tells a lot of it actually. Uh, there was, the name was sort of coined because we looked at them in imaging. They really showed up as little red dots. So, little, so there's a few aspects in that name. So when we say they are little dots, what that means is that they're very, very compact. You know, we all love seeing beautiful images of grand spiral galaxies that we've seen from Hubble, that we've seen from JWST. These are, well, little red dots. They're little red smudges uh, in the imaging, which means that they are smaller than what JWST can easily resolve. So you can imagine, you know, thinking about seeing a light bulb very, very far away, you'd never see the filament, you just see it as a little dot of light. This is sort of what we're seeing there. And the red part comes from the distribution of light that we see from these objects. Generally speaking, um, when we go toward the infrared wavelengths, we see that the more infrared we go, the stronger their um, uh, 
uh, their emission becomes. What's the connection between CAPERS, LRDZ9, and the little red dots? Yeah, so so uh, when we look at the spectrum of CAPERS, LRDZ9, we see a very, well, I guess I call it classic, but really has been around for about two to three years now, if that. Uh, we, see a, uh, we see a classic little red dot spectrum. We see that in the restroom ultraviolet, it's rather blue. But then when we see in the uh, rest frame optical, we see that ascending red slope as we go to longer and longer wavelengths. And so it's really a dead ringer for these options, for these types of objects. I'm not sure I understand. So is it that the are these are the little red dots galaxies and the black hole is within a little red dot? Is that what's happening? That's one of the current that's the uh, that's the currently accepted model. We're seeing galaxies here that are hosting black holes. That's that's very interesting. Okay, so so I want to go back to the big picture again. So what's going on in the early universe? Can you tell us again? Tell us in the the context of these little red dots and this massive black hole inside of one of them. So what's yeah. happening at that time of the universe? Mm -hmm. So this is first of all really the frontier that we're finally starting to probe and starting to push. So we don't know exactly what's going on. But the idea is this is the epoch where we have all our first stars, our first galaxies, our first black holes all forming. And especially in the case of Kepler's LRDZ9, what we're seeing potentially here is we're seeing a black hole at the center of a galaxy that's very, very compact. And we see that black hole actively in a cycle of growing. Maybe it formed very recently, maybe it's been growing for a little bit, hard to tell just yet. But right now, it's actively growing very, very rapidly. And while it's doing that, we also see an interesting signature from this object. Based on the light we're seeing it emitted, it appears that there's a dense shell of gas surrounding that central uh, uh, active black hole. And what that dense shell of gas is doing is taking the light that that black hole is emitting, and it's attenuating it. And it's making it give that characteristic red shape that we see from a little red dot. Meanwhile, we also expect that other parts of this galaxy, we expect to see uh, star formation just starting to occur. And that's sort of the snapshot we have right now. Longer term, we can definitely speculate on what this type of object and what all little red dots perhaps will eventually become. In the modern universe, local universe, we see very, very few of them. So they have to go somewhere. And gen the most generally accepted idea is that they become many of the local galaxies that we see today. I was going to ask that question. Could one of these little red dots, could our Milky Way galaxy have started out as a little red dot? That's a very interesting question. I'm not sure I've ever had anyone actually ask that before. And, you know, I, I don't see a good reason why it couldn't have. You know, 13 billion years is a long time for uh, things to evolve, especially if you're starting that far back. You know, if we imagine that our the black hole in our summer galaxy wasn't as massive as it is today, which is almost inevitable. It had to have grown from something. It's certainly possible that it could have undergone a little red dot phase, perhaps. Then after a while, the black hole calmed down. There was more time for stars to build up. And we can get into exactly this type of design we see now. That's one of the very big open questions in little red dot studies as we find more and more of these is how are they evolving and what do they evolve into? It's a fascinating uh, open line of inquiry at the moment. That was astrophysicist Anthony Taylor of the Finkelstein Research Group at the Cosmic Frontier Center at the University of Texas at Austin. And we were talking about Kepler's LRDZ9, the most distant black hole yet confirmed, and about a little red dot, a newly discovered or recently discovered kind of galaxy in the early universe that the black hole calls home. We're Earth Sky, and we're here every weekday around midday in North America. If you like hearing directly from scientists, please subscribe, like, and share. One Earth, one sky, Earth Sky.